Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's go to God in a word of prayer as we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to come together this morning to fellowship with your saints, Father, as your saints. Father, please help us to be separate from the world as your saints. We want to be more and more like you would have us to be, Father. Please help us to, to do so. Father, please be, uh, be with us in our study today. Help us, Father, to see what your word is saying. To not only gain intellectual insight into your word, Father, but to conform to what your word says, to be the people you would have us to be. And Father, we ask you, please, to be with, be with our worship later on today, that we do everything according to your word. Father, that we worship you not only in truth, but also in spirit. Help us, Father, to be people who worship when we sing songs of praise to your name. Help us, Father, as we come together around the table to remember your son's sacrifice and to realize this is the reason we come together, to celebrate the sacrifice of your son and what it means for us for eternity. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. In your son's name, we pray this prayer. Amen. We are in James chapter 4. If you turn your Bibles, please, to James chapter 4. Here in James chapter 4, we have been dealing with uh, the problems that the church that James was writing to was having with each other. And literally, that's the way to say it. They were having it with each other. They were treating each other poorly. They were, they were jealous. They were, uh, they were seeking themselves first. And we, did, we discussed those first four verses in, in the Bible and what their difficulty was. And their difficulty was, even when they asked for things, they were asking with the wrong intentions. And so basically they were unrepentant. Again, I want to I wanna reiterate what that word literally means. It's not only the fact that they had sins in their life that they needed to correct, I guess that is totally it, but the one thing they needed to repent of was their worldly way of thinking. It, they needed to repent of it. They needed to make a commitment to God. Whether or not they made the commitment originally when they became Christians, and I like to think they did, Okay, they made that commitment originally, but they were allowing, allowing worldly ways of thinking, worldly ways of acting, to come back into their lives. And so James is coming down hard on them. And we, we basically started verse 4 last week. I want to I wanna reiterate the very beginning of verse 4. He says, you adulteresses. Okay? He uses a phrase, right, a word right there. By the way, recognize, I know we're not under the Ten Commandments anymore. Of course, we know in the New Testament, uh, adultery is still considered a sin in the New Testament. But understand, understand something for these Christians, which I believe we, we discovered when we first started the, the book. They were probably of Jewish descent, these, these Christians. The words that he uses at the very beginning of, of the 12 tribes of the dispersion. The idea that he uses talking about when someone comes into your synagogue. I mean, he, key, he continually uses words that show that the majority, if not all, of his readers are people of Jewish descent. Christians of Jewish descent. And so when he uses this word adulteress, it's a double whammy on them. First off, of course, adultery is wrong in the New Covenant. But under the Ten Commandments, where they, which they most certainly knew very well, adultery was one of the, was one of the sins under the Ten Commandments. And although they're not, they were not, and we're, we never have been, under the Ten Commandments, they would have recognized right, right away the, the, the harshness, uh, harshness, well, I want to say the word harshness. It would have seemed harsh to them. Of his words to them, he calls them adulteresses. Okay? Something that a follower of God would never want to be considered an adulteress. But that word is one that was used oftentimes under the Old Testament for spiritual adultery. God considered himself to be married to Israel under the, under the Old Covenant. That's the kind of covenant they had. A covenant of marital relationship. And so whenever they followed after false gods, in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 3.20, 
Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 32, Hosea chapter 2, verse 7. In each one of those times, God considered them to be harlots or adulteresses, okay, because they were supposed to be spiritually married to him. And so to go after some false god instead of following God was like adultery. Okay? Um, under the New Covenant, Christians are also considered that way. And so it's a, very, it's a very telling thing under the New Covenant. Now, most of us know what it says in Revelation 19.7 about the church being considered the bride of Christ. But go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. I want to show you that's exactly how Paul uses it, spiritual adultery being, cons- being committed by Christians. And I want, you to, I want you to recognize and understand his, what they were committing, adul- who they were committing adultery with. He's not talking about falling down and worshiping physical idols. He's talking about them worshiping a different Christ. In other words, there were people coming around teaching false teaching about Jesus Christ. And even that is considered spiritual adultery. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. Okay, and he goes on later on, he goes on in a few verses. Well, let me go ahead and read it. It's only three verses away. Verse three, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom you have not preached, or you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. Okay, there's, there's his point. If someone comes along and teaches a different teaching that isn't, isn't compatible with the teaching of Jesus Christ, you're committing spiritual adultery. You're no longer, you're no longer uh, acting correctly to your betrothed, Jesus Christ. Now, he also uses that word, a different spirit, there in, uh, in, in, the, in that idea. And that could certainly be pointing to not only the fact of following after a different teaching, but the way they're acting in following it. This can go right back to what we're seeing in James chapter 4, the idea that they were considered adulteresses, because they certainly had a different spirit. It wasn't the spirit of God that they should have had the way they were treating each other. Okay, so whether you're talking about the idea of following a different teaching, or whether you're talking about the idea of living a different teaching, both are most certainly adultery against God. Not talking about all sin and fall short of the glory of God, not talking about the fact that every once in a while we trip up and we need to get that right with God, and, and if we're the right attitude, we will get it right with God. Not talking about the one-time sin, talking about the continual living and acting in a certain way. Okay, so so that's considered by God adultery to be that way. All right. James make it obvi- makes it obvious this idea by calling brethren adulteresses instead of adulterers. That uh, yeah, instead of using the word adulterers, notice what he's doing with adulteresses. Remember, the church is considered the bride of Christ. <laughs> It's a, the, the Greek word, for instance, for ecclesia is a, fe, is a feminine word. That's why that's, that's not, not a coincidence that God uses that, that term that way. And then instead of calling, calling them adulterers, which normally when God's word is talking about, about Christians, it'll use the male, the male idea, you know, but it includes both males and females, but it uses, uses the masculine most often. But when talking about the church as a whole, the feminine is used because the ecclesia is a feminine word and the church is the bride of Christ. Okay? So he's obviously making that, making that point about them being God's bride by using that phrase adulteress. Any comments on that? Paul's teaching in Galatians, in Galatians speaks of a, uh, another gospel too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. 
Um, right. The, uh, yeah, if anyone teaches another gospel, and, and the fact in verse 6, you're right, that they were following after a different gospel. And I like the way Paul says it there. Remember, the word gospel is the word means good news. And so he mm -hmm. says, you're following after a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. You know, it's not good news at all. It's bad news because it's not going to do anything for you. So it's not good news. Excellent, excellent point, Bob. Um, yes, Gail. Then if someone from the Church of Christ would visit a denomination, wouldn't that be spiritual adultery? Just visiting? No, I don't think so. Paul the Apostle visited visited a uh, a uh, a, a place where idols were. Just visiting is is not the going the going and fellowshipping. If, if a if a member of the Lord's Church is fellowshipping with with people who are not of God, fellowshipping that's in other words considering themselves to be to be one spiritually. Then yes, most certainly they would be by action be considered that. You know. Yeah. And that needs to be our reason for doing it, but trying to trying to make contacts, trying to trying to reach people. Yes. But the gospel's already been preached for ages. In Paul's day, most certainly, there's people there's people in this day that still need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do they need to hear it? Yeah, yeah. But you can't you can't preach someone the gospel if you're fellowshipping with them. Oh, amen. Yeah. Once again, fellowshipping with them would be totally wrong. But visiting, okay? If I was asked to come and speak somewhere that was a man-made religion, I would come and speak. They probably wouldn't invite me back the second time, <laughs> but I would come and speak, you know, to be able to deliver to deliver the truth of God's word to people. And, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, not at all. Especially if I'm saying things that would be outside of their belief system. Again, Paul the Apostle stood in a in an idol worshiping area. And I understand what you're saying about the gospel needed to go out, but please understand something. God's word doesn't make that distinction. You're making the distinction that, well, because the gospel hadn't gone out to the whole world, it was okay then, but it's not okay now. My question to you is going to be, I need to have scripture that shows that why that's a distinction. God's word doesn't make the distinction. Okay, and so it's and so we remember we follow by command, example, and necessary inference. With Paul the Apostle going out, even to man made religions, Paul the Apostle going out to reach people, he would be there. There's our example, and it's an example that we most certainly can follow today. You know, not going to fellowship, going to be there to say we are one in God. No, that would be wrong. But going to be able to show people the truth. He visited synagogues. Okay. Let me ask you something else. Sure. Did, did he go and every time that he was supposed to be preached? No, no, no. If God's, if, 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 no, I wouldn't go visit a man made religion when God's people are coming together. Not at all. No, no, no. No, no, no. Let me tell you one, well. I'm sorry, I'm going to get myself off, off powers. But no, not, not at all. I agree. What we should be with God's people when God's people are joining together. I don't care if we're talking about work, uh, going to the beach, or going to some other religious, religious function that doesn't belong to God. I agree. None of those things. It falls in the same category where, where we should be instead. Amen. Good, good questions, Gail. I appreciate that. Um. Now, look at the next phrase. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Okay, now, look at what he's saying. Again, I, and I think we might have touched on this while we were going through the list of sins they were committing. But notice what he's calling friendship with the world. I want to make a reiterate one thing I said last week as well, and that is he's not talking about we can't have friends who aren't Christians. That's not the context here. 
how in the world are we going to be able to reach people unless we have acquaintances who are outside the church? And we all have, we all not only have friends, we have family members who aren't Christians. Just to, for that to say you can't have a relationship, an understanding, a, a physical um, relationship or, or friendship with someone who's not a Christian, that's not what he's talking about. And, and, I, and I know people have tried to use this verse towards that idea. But instead he's saying the friendship is the way you're acting. You are friendly with them in acting the same way they are. You are showing yourself to be akin to them, to be family of theirs by the way you're acting like them. Okay, And again, the friendship in the context here, he's talking about the way you treat one another Okay, is, is, is the problem. Um, brothers in Christ should act like brothers in Christ. Bob? You know, friendship with both is an impossibility when you when you have a, a, try to have a partial friendship with the world and still remain a Christian that's an impossible situation because just just indulging with them for any period of time will cause one to lose their senses well their again in, in context indulging with them would mean acting like them again sure. All right. So yeah, for any for any millisecond, <laughs> acting like that is a sin. Right off the bat, we're not supposed mm -hmm. to act the way they are. Again, we can have friends in the world. We can go to parties. And when I say parties, I mean, I don't mean <laughs> drunken parties. I'm talking about I'm talking about you know gatherings, uh, family reunions. Again, we have family reunions. We're going to be having people there who are not who are not Christians unless. Your whole family has become have become Christian. The chances are you're going to have someone who, who is not a Christian at a family reunion. Uh, gatherings. I'm I'm in the Air Force. Every once in a while we have a reunion in uh, in the Dayton, Ohio area. I haven't made it yet, <laughs> but I but I want to go sometime to one of our reunions we have. This year I think was canceled because of because of everything going on with the with the the virus. But sometime I would like to go to that reunion. I've got a high school reunion. Unfortunately, my year doesn't have any high school reunions anymore. We had our 10th, and no one was willing to, to uh, set up the other ones. But there's a general high school reunion in Reevesville, West Virginia, that I hope to go to sometime. Okay? Not everyone there is going to be, going to be Christians, but I'm going to go there and, and, and want to see people and, and have friends. I have friends that are there. You know, um, I, I want to meet with people. And so... And so there's nothing wrong with being around non-Christians. Quite frankly, being around non-Christians is a requirement for Christians. How are you going to reach people if you aren't around people who need to hear the gospel? Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, again, acting like that. And notice, notice, the, notice the bluntness of, of James here. Friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Okay, uh, that idea uh, you are an enemy, you are at war with God when you are living like the world. All right, that's what God has called us out from being. I used that. I used a little little bit ago uh, a word in my prayer that uh, I, I did on purpose. The word saint. What does the word saint mean? It means okay. It's the same thing as holy. That's right. What's the word holy mean? And don't say saint. <laughs> don't you dare say saint. What's the word saint? And by the way, those are the same, they're the same words. Saint and holy and sanctified are all of the same root. All right? So I think there's another one too I'm not thinking of at the moment. Saint, holy, sanctified. That might be it. What do those words mean? What's that? It is a quality of God, most certainly a quality of God. The word means set apart. That's what the word means. When something's holy, it's set apart from evil. It's set apart from worldliness. Okay? Christians are saints. There's some religions out there that believe there's some kind of, some kind of special level of Christianity, Christianity that requires a miracle being done or something to show that you're a saint. Wrong. 
If you are a Christian, you are a saint. There is no vote needing to happen to make you a saint. If you are a Christian, that's what you are. And so when Paul the Apostle writes a couple of, a couple of different of his, of his letters, he addresses it to the saints. For instance, I can't remember if he uses that word with, with the Corinthian letter, but if he does, to the saints in Corinth. Well, who are they? The people who are voted in, who are holier than all the other Christians who are there who are saints? No. They're the Christians. They're the church. We, as Christians, are saints, or at least we're supposed to be. There's the problem we're seeing right here. These people are not being saint-like, saintly, all right? They're not being like they're supposed to be, Christians. Instead, they are, friend, they are friends with the world. They're acting very unsaintly, all right? And God has called us to be saints. From the very moment we came out of the waters of baptism, we are to be saints, we are to have made the decision to be saints, to be set apart from the world, repent, when we became Christians. And so Christians are saints. Now, you might want to be careful going around talking to people and saying to some people in the world, I'm a saint, because they're going to, they're gonna, unless you're ready to study the Bible with them, they're going to think you think a little bit highly of yourself, all right, that you think you're more holy or special or whatever. No, I'm just saved. But that makes me a saint. Okay, I am a saint, and uh, we're also going to be studying <coughs> tomorrow. We're going to be studying that word in our daily Bible study. Saint, we're going to go in there and, and sanctify Albert. and holy. And uh, yes, Bob. The the word church means the called out. Yes, very which good. Which means exactly the same thing. Individually, we make up those who are called out. Yeah, exactly. The church ecclesia means called out. Okay, called out of what? Called out of the world called out from those who are among you, around you, okay? That same word is used speaking of the idol worshipers in Ephesus, I believe, is where they were. When they were, remember when they, they were screaming, great is the goddess Diana after, uh, after uh, uh, Paul had come in and, and been converting many of them, and uh, the, idol, the idol makers were concerned, the, uh, the, idol, the idol makers guild, <laughs> were concerned because they were going to be losing their, their money because people were going to stop buying idols. And so they, had, they were having a riot. But when it was all over and the, and the town clerk had, uh, had basically told them, you need to go home, the Romans are going to come in and they're going <laughs> to set things straight and it's not going to be very comfortable. You know, they're gonna be, we're going to be accused of rioting. We need to go home. It then says he dismissed the church. Well, it's the Greek word ekklesia. He dismissed the assembly. That's what the word means. They were called out. They were called out from the rest of the rest of the city in anger and rioting over the idea that they were they were going to lose money. And Diana, goddess Diana, was not going to be glorified like she should be. They were upset religiously. They were upset financially, and they were upset both ways. But the but the text says he dismissed the assembly. Most of our translations. I don't, there's not one translation that says he dismissed the church because we don't, you know, we, our English translators aren't going to translate it that way. But the word ecclesia merely means assembled people, especially assembled people who, are, who have been taken out of a larger group. The city of Elkins. We are the church, the assembly, taken out of a bigger group of the city we are called out. We have come together and assembled. Okay. Congregation. Yeah, and congregation. Exactly that idea. Sometimes, and by the way, sometimes that word ecclesia in some of our translations is translated congregation. Remember uh, Stephen's words in uh, in Acts chapter seven when he talked about the Israelites, the assembly in the wilderness. Guess what Greek word was there? Ecclesia. What had they been called out from? Called out of Egypt. They were the assembly in the wilderness. But the Greek word that's there is ekklesia. And so sometimes we get caught up, and that's one of my, that's one of my favorite word things to discuss. The word church is kind of a made-up word. It's not even, it's not even a, uh, a, uh, it's not even a uh, transliteration of the Greek word. The Greek word is ekklesia. Uh, but it's not even a translation, transliteration of ecclesia. It's a made-up word. It's an old 
Middle English word that basically means circle, because in the in the in the in the middle, in the in the, that time period, I can't think of the, the name of it. In that time period, the church was called the kirk, and kirk is a word for circle, and the assembly normally sat in a circle when they worshiped God, so they just called it where the circle. All right, we just moved the that Middle English word into church. And we call it church. And there's nothing wrong with the word church. Please understand something. I'm not trying to down the word church or the word kirk, you know, of the Middle English. I'm just saying we need to understand what the word means. And the word means called out, which, as Bob pointed out, is very much like the idea of being a saint. We're called out of the world. We are saints. We are set apart from the world. Okay? So, yeah, excellent point, Bob. Both those words... Both those words, ecclesia, called out, and, and the word for saint, okay, um, are both words that speak about our relationship apart from the world, being different from the world. It's like one of our trans, one of our translations says for Second Peter, for First Peter chapter two, we are a peculiar people. Okay? It doesn't mean we're weird. Chances are we are considered weird by a lot of people. But it means we're we are different from the world. Okay. Um, you know, Albert, this brings to mind too, First uh, John chapter two, verse 15, 16, 17, Love not the world. Any 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 uh, uh, association we have with the world is bound to influence us in some way. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Exactly, Bob. So. Um, Okay, we've talked about those, those two things. So anyone who makes himself... Caught my cover. Anybody who makes himself a friend of the world is... He comes right out and says it. Some of our translations says, at enmity with God. Others of our translations say what it's saying, or, or make themselves an enemy of God. Okay, this is not... This is not something to be taken lightly. As I said, James has a tendency to be very blunt in his words. He is not someone who holds back in what he is saying. And he's saying that you make yourself to be an enemy of God. Remember Ephesians chapter 6. We oftentimes talk about it with the spiritual armor. Okay, we're at spirit. Who are we at war with according to Ephesians chapter 6? Oh, Satan. Yeah, the easy way to say it is Satan. He, he says we are at wars with the spiritual, the, 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 the dark domains, spiritual. The, the spiritual world. Okay. And, go ahead. There's yeah. a, a few times in the scriptures where it says we're called out of darkness. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Ephesians or yeah. Either Ephesians or Colossians chapter 1. I think it's Colossians 1, where we have been called out of the domain of darkness. Excellent point, Gail. That we were called out of the domain of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. I think that's Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18? 13. 13 and 14. Okay. Got close. Okay. So, so notice, notice that idea. We're called out of darkness. Okay. Um, so... That means that when we do otherwise, we be, we're becoming back in the darkness. When we are living like darkness. This falls back again. To, again, I, I've quoted this, these verses several times, but the, it fits together. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. What if we don't walk in the light as he is in the light? We're talking about not fellowshipping those in the world. What if we don't walk in the light as he is, as he is in the light? We're walking with the world. We're walking with the world, and we don't have fellowship one with another. Notice the implication of that, those words. You can't do both. You can't have both. The Jews tried to <coughs> worship God and idols. God didn't accept that. They couldn't do that. That's one of the reasons why Judah went into captivity. We're going to be talking about that this morning. Why Judah went into captivity. They were trying to do both, and that was unacceptable to God. It didn't matter the day we're worshiping God. We're doing exactly what the covenant says to worship God. You're doing exactly what the covenant said don't do by worshiping idols. That doesn't do any good. 
Even if you get everything right about your worship towards God, and yet you're still worshiping idols, you're not doing everything right according to your worship to God. You're adulteresses. And that's the idea that, that James is trying to tell these people right here. They may have done everything they no doubt did, do everything they needed to do in order to become Christians. Now they're not acting like Christians. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, so, Albert, thinking thinking about this too, this this particular idea of being in the world is is prevalent throughout the Bible. It reminds me of Psalms chapter one, verses one and two, the progressiveness of which one can allow themselves to become drawn into the ways of the world. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's very <coughs> very slowly can be drawn in. That's a very good point. Most people don't come out of the waters of baptism and immediately decide or become very ugly spiritually. We slowly work our ways that direction if we're not careful. Now, any other questions on four? Because five is going to probably possibly take the rest of our rest of our time this morning. Five is a very difficult passage. Quite frankly, and you're, you're, you're hardly ever going to hear me say these words about God's Word. We don't know for certain what it's saying. There's four possible things he's saying. All of them are true. In fact, we got four translations, the American Standard, the King James, the New American Standard, and, and whatever other translation. They're all different. They all take a different possible aspect for what this verse is saying. Every one of them is saying something that's true according to God's word. It doesn't contradict the thing. But we just don't know, we just don't know for certain what he's saying. So let, let's look at it real quick. Here's what verse 5 says. Or do you think, this is in my trans, I think I'm using the American standard here. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously, jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Now that probably, unless you have the exact same translation I have, that probably doesn't sound a thing like what your translation says. Okay? So let's consider each one of these possible ideas of what he is saying here. All right? Um, and by the way, when he says the scripture speaks here, um, there is no place in the scriptures where the following statement can be found word by word. And so he's talking about a general teaching of the scripture. That's another reason why I have no difficulty with not being certain of what he's saying here. As long as it agrees with the scripture, you're not going to go wrong with, with something here. But there's no, there's no Old Testament scripture or New Testament scripture you're going to find. Your Bible probably doesn't footnote a thing for that word scripture speaks to no purpose, does it? <laughs> Most of, most of our Bibles will tell you what scripture it's coming from. They'll take you there. They'll, they'll give you the reference, but there's no reference here for this. So James is merely talking about a commonly understood general truth about God's word. All right. Um, so the next phrase, or do you think he says this to no purpose? He's, he's saying to James, that's why the Bible mentions this. That's why the Bible talks about what he's getting ready to say. Now, as I said, there's, there's like four different possible things he's saying. Let me, let me read each one of them. I've, I've written down, uh, the King James says, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. The American Standard says, Doth the spirit which he made to dwell in us long unto envying? Sounds much like the King James. The New American Standard he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. And finally, the NIV, the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely. Okay, uh, Let's consider each one of these possibilities. Um, first off, the human spirit which God put in us longs unto a point of envy. Okay. With this idea, with this translation, are two different opinions of what's being said. First, that within each of us, Christian, he is speaking, is a spirit that God has given them 
that is longing after worldly things. Well, that idea is certainly taught in Romans chapter 7, you know, that our desire is to sin, we're constantly battling with, okay? So that's a possibility. I tend to wonder about, about it in the context. I mean, he just said about being a French friend with the world. So we have spirits, sadly, that if we don't, if we don't corral them in, if we don't, if we don't safeguard ourselves, put barriers up, or as like Paul said, uh, uh, buffet ourselves daily, we will go into sin. The possibility he may be saying that, and, the, and I guess it is, it is a good possibility given this, what James is talking about here. Uh, that's what seems to be happening to the people that James is, is, uh, is talking to. The second possibility of that translation is that James is rejecting the idea that God would put a spirit in man that would long after things of the world and is asking them if they believe it since their actions seem to indicate they do. Okay, well, I have a little bit of a problem with, with, that, uh, with that idea, but the James is basically making a, making a uh, stating something that's absurd and saying, would God give you such a spirit? Okay, again, no, God would not give us such a spirit. Um, the KJV and the NIV seem to agree with the first of these opinions, however. The idea that our spirit, our human spirit, is, uh, is longing for something it should not have. Okay? Again, that's a scriptural teaching from, from Romans chapter 7, but whether it's talking about that or not is the question. Next one. God, uh, taking him as the subject of the verb, yearns for the human spirit. Okay? This translation says that God wants the loyalty and devotion of the spirit of his people. That's an obvious teaching from God's word. God wants us to, to de desire him. God wants us to be devoted to him. And so this, this again, has some precedent in the idea of, of God being a jealous God towards his people. He's jealous of us. He wants us. He desires us. He doesn't want us to be living like the world. He wants us to be living like he created us to live. A definitely true teaching, if that's what he's talking about there. The next one, the Holy Spirit, which God made to dwell in us, yearns for us, for our loyalty and devotion to him to the point of being jealous or an envious spirit. Okay, when a person becomes a Christian, they are given the gift of the Spirit. They are sealed with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 1. If we sin way too much, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Our bodies are the temple of God, the Holy Spirit living in, inside of us. We're not talking about miraculous gifts. That's something totally different. Okay? And the, the church had the gift of the Holy Spirit when they became Christians, but they did not have the miraculous gifts until the apostles laid hands on them. This is not the same thing. But it is, it is God has given us his Spirit as His Holy Spirit as an earnest towards our redemption. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses uh, around verse 12. That idea, he is our earnest. And so, and so that idea most certainly is a, is a very true scriptural concept. God desires us to be his holy temple. When we use our bodies for sinful things, we're using this holy temple for sinful things. Okay? And so it's a good, that's, a good trend, that's a good possibility. And if that's what he's meaning, it makes... Of the obvious sense with what he's talking about in the scripture as well. They weren't living as Christians should. They were using their bodies for sinful practices of the way they were treating each other. And so that's a, that's a possibility. Okay. Um, I thought I missed one here. Oh, it, it is quoting from a scripture? I mean, is it, is it, or is it just showing an idea? Uh, or is it just showing verses that give a similar idea? But it's not a word for word quotation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and you're absolutely right, by the way. You, we could find several, like I mentioned, Romans chapter 7 would be a possible place to go to for one of the ideas. So you're absolutely right. But, but my comment with that first part is, is there a scripture that says those exact words, you know, 
Like, remember in Matthew, when he quoted about Jesus would be a light unto the Gentiles? You know, Matthew quotes that. Well, you can go to an Old Testament verse and see where it says. In fact, you can see in our English translations, it's kind of got quote marks around it and shows and shows that it's actually saying that somewhere. And so, uh, literally saying it. Okay. But in 1 Corinthians 6, right. verse 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? There you go. It's in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. There you go. Yeah, see, there's that idea of the spirit that God put in us yeah. is envying for our spirit, or God himself, the Father, envies, desires that spirit back, us being tagged along. <laughs> you know, that idea of us, us coming along, but God envies after or desires after. We use that word envy oftentimes to talk about a sinful thing. It's not a sinful thing, okay? Desires after... At the spirit he's given us. Either one of those concepts are a true concept. All right. Uh, but again, because of the way, and I want to, I want to do two things here. I want to let you know why we don't know for certain which one it's saying, and that's because the Greek here is written in such a way that can mean any of those things we just discussed. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one it means. It isn't going to mean anything that's opposite of God's word. Perhaps God had it written that way. Here's one possibility, and I'm, I'm not saying this is true, but perhaps God had it written that way to have all four ideas pulled together to understand it. It could mean any of those. So as opposed to being, well, I don't know what that means, so there's no way I can possibly understand all of God's word. It's like, no, don't worry about that. It means all four of those things all four of those things are true, so it doesn't matter which one it is. I, I personally wonder if that's the reason why it's written in such a way that we can't be certain. I think James knew what he meant, and I think it's perhaps true that the people he was writing to knew exactly what he meant. But when we try to bring this over into the English language, and I said that when I first started, you're not going to hear me say this very often, because God's word doesn't do that. The Greek is very precise. The Greek is something that we can most certainly understand very well. And this is, this is really the only verse I can think of in the New Testament where we just have to go there and go, I'm not positive what he means. He could mean this, he could mean this, he could mean this, and he could mean this. All of them are true. So don't get, don't get concerned and worried and say, well, there's lots of the Bible that we can't understand. No! <laughs> here's, a, here's an example of a verse that we're not certain. Okay? You got me on this one. But it's, it, none of those possibilities are against what God's word says already. Bob? Yeah, Brother Diane Woods makes this comment in, in one of his commentaries. Men in the flesh and motivated by fleshly inclinations are often prone to look with envious hearts upon those who enjoy greater prosperity than they possess and covetously to desire the possessions of others. That would be, yeah, and, and once again, he's, that's, that, that's that first one we looked at. Uh, the King James and the NIV both seem to be pointing that direction. Yeah. yeah, that would be one possible idea, and, it, and it's certainly true. It is a true statement. We can go to God's Word and see, see that it's true. But uh, what, it, what it is for certain saying, we just cannot, I would not stand up and dogmatically say, this is what I believe it is. I remember when I first studied this, I had my favorite of the four ideas. I don't even remember what my favorite is anymore because I finally come to the realization that it doesn't matter which one it is. They all mean the same thing. They all mean something that's true. And so I had my favorite. It wasn't that one. I'm pretty certain it wasn't that one. My favorite had to do with the Holy Spirit being inside the question, the one that your verse, your verse went to, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the one your Bible referenced. That happens to be, I, I'm, I'm almost positive, having to do with that, that happened to be my favorite idea, that God has put us, put a Holy Spirit, put his Holy Spirit in us that desires for us to do the right thing, or that God desires it back, him, him, not it. Holy Spirit is not a it. Devi desires him back and us along with him, <laughs> you know, to come with him. All right, God's given us that Holy Spirit because he knows he's wanting that Holy Spirit back. And that's how 
wonderfully he desires us. So either one of those two possibilities happens to be my favorite. I'm not going to dogmatically say, and that's what it is, because I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or, or the God, the God, yeah, you know, God say something yeah, say that something that is not true. Yeah. yeah, and they should have known better. That that might be another reason why I think, of course, I'm I'm biased, <laughs> but I think that my thoughts on that is is true because that's something the Christian's going to know immediately. They're going to know that they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when they become Christians, and and what He does for us by the washing and regeneration of our souls as mentioned in Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Okay, Christ, it was God's plan, it was Christ's blood, and it was the Holy Spirit's washing and regeneration, the three working together for our salvation. Okay, and I, I was right. I went three minutes over. I knew, I knew this, this verse was going to take us a little bit of time because of <laughs> everything. It's like studying four verses at once <laughs> because of everything it could possibly mean, you know. And, and I will finish repeating myself. I kind of wonder if that's why God did it that way. He wrote it in such a way that it could mean any of those four things. Because all of those four things are true. And all of those four things were affecting or being it or were showing the effect that the people that James is writing to were having in their lives. Okay. Most certainly. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. And we'll, we'll conclude there. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Father, although we may, not, we may not be able to figure out exactly what you meant by this verse, we know, Father, that those four possibilities are exactly true. And Father, we want to be followers of your word. We want, Father, to be connected to you. We want to live in such a way, Father, that we are, that we are subject to you but have a relationship with you both at the same time. Help us, Father, to always appreciate the way you care for us. Help us, Father, to grow in your truth and to be more and more confirmed, conformed to the image of your Son. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. In your Son's name, we pray this prayer. Amen. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your comments.